<laughs> uh, hey everybody, welcome to How to Talk to Girls at the Mall. Uh, Brady and Anna in Seattle. We have uh, two comrades on the line with us. Um, Marianne, if you could introduce yourself and uh, tell everyone why you're here. My name is Marianne and I live in New York and I was invited onto this podcast for my <laughs> flaming on the internet about the issue of guns, especially the left's positions on guns. Perfect, thank you. And uh, we also have Alex who is in Washington State. Alex, can you tell us a little bit uh, who you are and why you're here? Hi, well, I uh, won't talk too much about myself, but I'm Alex, I use he, him pronouns. I'm from the Seattle chapter, the Puget Sound chapter of the John Brown Gun Club. We're an anti-racist gun club, part of the Redneck Revolt Network. Perfect, thank you. So, um, we've actually talked about this exact topic, um, wanting to do it as a show for a while. And then, of course, the mass shooting happened in Las Vegas recently, and so we said, okay, well, it might be a good time to finally do it. So um, why don't you start with, uh, with the context of the United States gun violence? Well, I mean, I think that it's safe to say that everyone can agree that, that gun violence in the U.S. is certainly an outlier, especially mass shootings. Um, people in the U.S. have pretty extreme access to a lot of guns, so I guess the first kind of Topic would just be like, is this, is this a problem? I know that sounds really trite, but kind of like, where do you lie on like how much of a problem this is or is it? What's happening with guns in What's the United States, with, yeah, man? Kind of <laughs> so the, the 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 talking point, if you will, that I usually start from is very similar to that Onion article that they keep repurposing every time there's a mass shooting which goes something like, you know, um, mass shooting utterly preventable according to only country where this ever happens or something like that. Um, and I consider it to be an issue of American exceptionalism to think that um, the unique, let's say, political and racial and cultural history of the United States is such that there is no way that we could possibly introduce any kind of uh, legislative measure or policy or, or, or anything that could curb the amount of gun violence that takes place in the United States. So there's, there's this idea that the United States is so incomparable to other countries, including like, you know, rich, Western, developed, predominantly white countries, countries that are a result of colonization, countries, you know, any other country in the world, America is so unique that we couldn't possibly do anything about this or introduce any kind of change that might like curb what is an increasing trend of gun violence and mass shooting and that kind of thing and gun ownership in this country. So that's where I come in from and that's sort of my point of annoyance. It's massively different. I mean, you said at the beginning that that's almost not even controversial. Um, it's massively, the numbers are massively different than other countries. So both in terms of gun ownership, like the only country that has anywhere near that amount of private gun ownership is Yemen. And it's half as much as it is in the United States. Um, then in terms of like gun deaths, um, something like 30 people are shot to death a day in the United States and take any other, you know, use your nomenclature like western industrialized country and it's like five or below um and that includes so a lot of these figures you know people will sometimes quickly point out that it's not just homicides but a lot of most gun deaths are self-inflicted um there's also of course the non-negligible amount of gun deaths at the hands of police in this country and so i'm talking about like sort of total gun deaths the united states is off the chart for that the united states is off the chart for mass shootings um, it's off the chart for, as I said, gun ownership, um, um, suicide by gun, homicide by gun, and um, apparently this trend of like mass shootings. And, and so the United States is different from any other country. It's off the charts when it comes to gun violence, whether self-inflicted or inflicted by others or inflicted by the police or anything else. Good. So that, I, I think that is uncontroversial. Um, and so I guess the implicit claim we're making here is that um, more guns and all that stuff uh, is in fact a corollary to the actual uh, sort of uh, 
I don't know the statistical word for it, but uh, the higher rate of violence here. That seems to be the case, and that seems to be the case even if you compare one state to another. So states that have more um, gun control legislation and policy have fewer uh, gun deaths as well. So even comparing within the United States. So Alex, for a counterpoint, not that you're for uh, you know, uh, mass shootings or anything like that, but um, how do you see uh, the, the, the trend of American exceptionalism as Mary is calling it? Well, I don't know. I'm really not an expert on that topic, but the, my personal opinion, something that is not brought up often enough in regards to this type of uh, thing, mass murder especially, is, uh, I mean, we say something about that the shooter's always male, but there's never really any deep conversation that follows about the, the role of patriarchal society shaping that tendency to resort to violence in males. I think it's a, a huge problem that shows up not only in mass shootings, but in, you know, the epidemic level of interpersonal violence and violence against women and female identified people as well. That's just kind of where I always go from that, uh, from, you know, ruminating on, on, on that fact. And I think that there could be the argument then that if it's more about toxic masculinity, that if you get rid of guns, you're just going to see more death by the hands of angry, you know, for instance, if you're talking about intimate partner violence, it might just result to another weapon. I mean, I've heard that kind of argument before, that if you got toxic masculinity, then you think you're going to find something else, and you got a, you know, an argument. I, I have to totally agree with Alex that this has everything to do with toxic masculinity. It has to do with the way, with misogyny and patriarchal, patriarchy and the way that, um, it also with the way that violence permeates culture. But I don't want to dilute the point. It has to do absolutely with toxic masculinity and the patriarchy. And I always get supremely annoyed when there's some story about like, it, if you read closely the stories of school shootings, very often the, the perpetrator uh, was like disproportionately going after women or killed uh, a, 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 an ex-girlfriend or like a, an unrequited love interest first or um, not to mention you know, murder had, suicides of people killing their partners and children and then themselves and that. absolutely and I I totally agree there's also a complete kind of like media blackout when it comes to discussing that issue but to me the fact that there is that aggressive culture is like actually a reason why you would want fewer guns in society and fewer firearms in the hands of people in the middle of all kinds of heated situations or situations that are already inflected with um, domestic violence or whatever now there's a tool um, which makes it extraordinarily easy to inflict a significant amount of violence and damage and harm. And so, I mean, I agree with you about the point that we ignore the other causes and causal factors of things like mass shootings or individual violence, but that doesn't to me translate to a reason why um, we should welcome more guns in society. I mean, it's definitely true if there, I mean, Gun violence is because guns are here, right? I mean, but the que the question of what to do about that, I guess, is the one that I... Is the solution to allow the capitalist state to determine who gets a gun? And that's where I'm get... That's where I get, you know, skeptical about, you know, what the actual answer is to gun violence. That so let's, let's parse this conversation um, up into two parts, I guess. One would be... Um, Marianne, what what do you see as a, a rational gun control policy or like some sort of progressive version of that really quickly? And then we can talk about how that may be useful or not. And then also as revolutionaries, um, what should our stance on guns be? So let's kind of cut that up a little bit. So, Okay, so practical measures of gun control. Um, circling back to the issue of domestic, domestic violence, for example, in Canada, if you want to get a gun license, and you can own, you know, a variety of firearms in Canada and a number of firearms and like, you know, handguns, whatever. And there's fairly high um, gun ownership, higher than people might realize in Canada. Um, but to get a firearm license, you have to uh, undergo a background check. And one of the things that's involved is they will speak to your last like two or three romantic or domestic partners about the fact that you're applying for a gun license. 
So that right there is a check on, um, you know, people's accessibility to fire, or people's access to firearms, um, which, like, yes, that involves the state. I don't think there's really any such thing as, like, legislation or policy that doesn't involve the corporate capitalist state. And, you know, there are certain ways that it um, behaves, absolutely. And I'm sure we're going to talk more about that. But that right there seems like a fairly unobjectionable, um, like, thing to introduce by means of gun control. Then there are all kinds of other solutions um, that, like Australia in 1996, I'm sure everybody's heard this story because it gets bandied about as a talking point among leftists, but they had a massive sh a mass shooting. I think some 30 people died and they immediately instituted um, significant uh, gun control policies, which included a huge buyback program, which seemed to have been like quite successful and they haven't had a mass shooting since and gun violence, including by suicide, has gone down significantly since then. But one of the objections that I hear from leftists is often like, look, the state enforces policy very unevenly and unequally. And the more tools you give it for, um, you know, especially like criminally investigating people, the more tools you're effectively giving it in order to like criminalize and persecute and pursue people of color. I think that that's true. I'm going to completely just grant that um, that idea. However, I do think that there are forms of curtailing, um, like the infusion of guns into American society, that actually go after the gun industry and the gun lobby, and don't go after individual citizens. So one of the things you could do is you could say, okay, a ban on se selling those like really big bullets, I think they're called high caliber, that shoot from the guns that shoot really fast and intensely. Again, don't know the technical terms. Um, but you could regulate the industry in such a way that those things are no longer available. I'm immediately ready to hop on uh, regulating, I mean, the small arms industry, especially in regards to one that doesn't get brought up, I feel that the United States exports weapons to, you know, repressive regimes all over the world. There's absolutely no reason we should be arming, you know, any other states, you know, that's something <laughs> we definitely can both agree on, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, in my communist utopia, we also have some version of, <laughs> you know, right, uh, the community deciding what a responsible use of guns is, who should have them and why, you know. I, and, you know, I think that, you know, speaking to people's partners or whatever, that sounds totally reasonable to me. I guess, uh, you know, I'm an anarchist just to out myself. I, I'm always skeptical of any type of state or agency, you know, taking over something that I feel like communities could do themselves. I was just going to say, it turns out that there may be three anarchists on this call, because I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming that when Brady says that Alex is not the anarchist, only anarchist in this call, he's referring to himself, so I also identify as an anarchist, which <laughs> in, in, in one respect, I know, there's, there's just a, a whole bunch of people just like clicked unsubscribe right now. <laughs> yeah. We're on Capitol Hill, and it is sometimes very loud. Yeah. Probably responding to some gun violence. Yeah. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't want to live in a society where everybody feels like they have to take a gun with them everywhere, but I, I do feel like that they do have a place for certain situations and that, you know, I definitely am not exactly in favor of just allowing the state to be the only one who is armed or determines who gets to be armed, you know? So, yeah, we're, we're naturally falling into this, so let's just go. Um, so I think that we're all on the same page and we all seem to be, uh, moderately reasonable at least, at least on this topic and none of us are condemning the other position here, but the standard canned answer for any kind of concern about, well, you know, let's keep guns out of the hands of crazy people or violent people or the horrible people or whatever is that you can get a gun on the street, probably cheaper and easier than um, a legitimate gun. And also, um, hey, aren't we revolutionaries? And don't we have Nazi enemies just like, you know, lurking about, doxing us and um, <laughs> armed to the teeth and apparently totally willing to use violence? Um, so isn't that a part of it? I mean, I'll just say right now that um, I was at the January 20th um, Milo event at the University of Washington where uh, someone was shot by a member of the alt-right. So, um, it was a wake-up call that this is a different period uh, politically and, and some different forces at play. So um, I don't have a definitive, you know, um, 
billboard answer for us. So I'm, I'm hopefully just going to get the smart people to talk about. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of, I mean, I'm interested in doing this kind of work because nonviolence is great and extremely effective, but it's a deeply personal choice and not everyone when faced with, you know, physical harm or the type of harm that's represented by Charlottesville is going to want to choose to be nonviolent. And I think that, you know, I would like to help to create a space where marginalized people, you know, trans people, other queer people, people of color feel safe to come and learn how to defend themselves. And if that practice involves guns, you know, to learn that too, because the gun culture that does exist in the country is actually, you know, not something that people from marginalized communities feel safe participating in if they want to go take a gun safety class. So that's that's my personal uh, uh, driving interest in trying to do this kind of work. So I, I've often also heard the argument that um, guns are especially necessary for people who come from communities that are, you know, uh, uh, significantly marginalized, subject to violence. That includes people of color, women, you know, trans people, obviously. And again, I, I have to, let me kind of state my position as an outsider, because in, in addition to being an anarchist, I'm also secretly Canadian. And <laughs> that's where a lot of my reaction to this comes from, which is, that like the the idea that the solution to social and systemic perpetration of violence against people from again call them like marginalized groups or whatever the idea that the solution to that is individual gun gun ownership just sounds like it sounds wild to me now statistically let me say some more like concrete and less subjective things statistically from like a public health perspective Again, if you add guns to a situation, like for example, a workplace, uh, a place of business, like a you know, a concealed carry, open carry, to um, a domestic situation, to a school, then they increase in incidence of violence, and in, including, in, and if not in particular, towards people like women, people of color, people who are vulnerable, right? So the idea that they are the tool for the protection of those individuals is kind of a misnomer. Um, I will acknowledge what Brady was saying earlier about certain movements, black movements in the United States, states which took up firearms in particular as a means of self-defense. I think the reasons for doing so were like entirely understandable during the civil rights era and during the Jim Crow era. Um, and it was then that actually gun control, um, significant gun control measures were introduced. And that was also, of course, around the time of the assassination of like, you know, JFK and RFK and MLK. So like, that's not really a, a, a coincidence, but at the same time, in large part, my understanding is those pieces of legislation were meant to basically curtail like revolutionary black gun ownership. Um, but at the same time, like you have things like move in Philly, you have like, it, it, the, the effect that you cannot, you know, sort of use private gun ownership to, I don't think, like, push back against the juggernaut that is the state when it comes to state repression. It, it's just, you know, um, they've been aggressively militarizing police forces for the last 30, 40 years in order to outpace that ability. So I, to me, that spells that you can't obviate the issue of like actual political organizing. And, you know, Alex mentioned nonviolence. I think there's a lot of perception of nonviolence that it's like some kind of like pacifist kumbaya person who like will sit on their hands until they are like beaten to death. Um, I participated earlier this year in like a pre-dawn picket that like actually physically stopped Teamsters from delivering to a restaurant that was having a, a job action, but it's nonviolent, right? Like that's another form of nonviolence. So nonviolence is simply carving out everything that isn't actually just like using violence in order to achieve an aim. And I do believe for reasons that are way too long to get into into this in this podcast, but that like violence itself, while necessary, isn't a means of like politically like moving the needle. Alex. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you too much there. I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm somebody that is immediately goes to the idea of, of guns and arming oneself, you know, as, as the first thing that you ought to do in a situation. I mean, 
especially even given the question of dealing with the state strategically, it's a much better choice to, to have some type of, you know, mass mobilizations and, you know, passive resistance and stuff. It's a lot more effective in that realm when you're dealing with someone who has an overwhelming monopoly of force, you know. So, I mean, I, I acknowledge the point that guns have a very limited and particular use. They're not a solution to all problems. I'm just in the position that we, you know, shouldn't necessarily be focusing on getting rid of them. So I guess, um, let me just open the door up for you just for a second here. Um, you are a member of the John Brown Gun Club. Um, what has inspired you and why is that important for for us right now in, uh, in the United States? I'm, I'm really excited about John Brown Gun Club because I really uh, like the idea of providing a space for marginalized people to come and learn uh, self-defense techniques and uh, sort of gain the, the, the feelings that come with being able to know that you're able to take care of yourself and to take care of your community. And I don't, I, I'm, it's deeply concerning seeing the rise of like far-right militia groups and other types of you know, not just Nazis, but you know, the, the, the Minutemen types and things. They're they're out there. They're doing this work. They're out there training with weapons. They're stockpiling guns. You know, it it would be good to not totally abandon that avenue of you know defending ourselves. I feel like so we'd like to do lots of other types of stuff too. I mean, I'd like to do community outreach. You know, I'd like to do like disaster preparedness. We've got a million ideas. I'd love to steal that brake light clinic praxis from DSA. That's fucking phenomenal. We want to get out and. I'd really like to spend most of my time just trying to be a positive force in the community and maybe teach people how to shoot good too. So is your kind of take on the role of guns then less of a let's arm all marginalized communities to start the revolution and more of a defensive role? Um, is that kind of you know, individuals defending themselves against other individuals as opposed to against the state? Is that kind of where you see the role of guns right now? Yeah, I would say that. I mean. Being an armed deterrent against far right groups, they they're you know, fascism is an ide ideology of, of domination and violence, you know, and those people are just looking for any excuse to feel like they're able to be superior. You know, when when you allow them to feel like they can dominate the situation, they're gonna be as violent as they can, you know, get away with being. And I think that showing them that they uh, are not gonna do it without a fight, that they won't feel as safe to be open fascists is worth, uh, worth pursuing. Can I ask another kind of question, I guess, is um, we're going to wait on the, the <laughs> siren that's going to uh, pass. Another shooting on Capitol Hill. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? It's all fucking, there's nothing is moving anyway. <laughs> and so part of me just thinks like, okay, that's great, we'll arm, you know, all the people of color um, and the poor people, and then the, the cops just have a really good reason to kill them all. I mean, does that, does that ring true for anyone else? I mean, I, I mean, I think I understand what you're saying, but I mean, the state is going to continue to be repressive regardless of what we do, right? I mean, they'll find another justification for, for you know, repressing people, whether you give them one or not. That's a good point. So, I think uh, you, men you mentioned Cece, but I think another good case to mention is the case of Marissa Alexander, who shot a warning shot into the ceiling, yes. and uh, a woman of color, and was sentenced to, you know, I don't know, some unreasonable amount of prison time. And the standard um, goes big, so we're right, yeah. right, and there have been like judges have made explicit determinations that stand your ground does not apply to victims of domestic violence. And this is the thing, like, um, the way that people, um, people of color, um, women, black women in particular, are going to be treated in so far, in as far as their firearm ownership is concerned, is going to be very different than the way that white people are going to be treated in terms of their firearm ownership. and. Um, whenever the state gets involved, it's going to come down more heavily on those people. I'm not, it's not, still not clear to me how, like, adding more guns to the mix is a solution. Likewise, 
circling back to the idea of um, using guns to fend off a rising threat from the alt-right, right? When I actually try to think through those scenarios, I just, I cannot um, kind of like puzzle out exactly what that is going to mean or, or how that would work, right? It sounds like a good idea, it feels like a good idea, but then I'm not quite sure how it works in practice. So for example, um, the rally in Boston by, I forget whether it was the Proud Boys or whoever, that was like massively, massively shut down with a 20,000 person, person counter demo. I think that that was much, much more effective, much more lasting, much more significant than the skirmishes that have happened where there have been like a relatively equal number of like um, alt-right people and left people. Um, and in that case, like the coefficient of effectiveness is just like numbers and not like individual guns. Um, when it comes to the incident that happened at the University of Washington and the shooting that happened there, again, like if there had simply be, been more guns among that crowd, I don't think that I, that that would have set anything off other than a bunch of confused firing that would have resulted in even more injuries. Um, like it's just not clear to me how you actually cash this out. I think a better defense against the alt right is a massification against them, as opposed to, you know. And I think about this in terms of like the workplace stuff that I'm involved in, you know. And I, again, I just, I, there's no scenario in my brain in which like us having a bunch of people who, there who are armed forestalls the violence. I mean, people have reported from Charlottesville and everywhere else that this kind of stuff happens, that the cops. You know, the people that the cops go after to disarm, again, by by the argument that the left itself is making, are like the left-wing people. The cops don't move in to disarm the militias and the right-wing people. And, okay, I'll make a final point and then I'll shut up because I'm talking too much, but, like, if, if what you want ultimately is some kind of overt confrontation between the far right and the left, or if you think even that such a thing is inevitable, I hate to say, and this is not like a polemical point this is just like an actual assessment of reality we're gonna get our asses kicked you know like the the far right and the fringe right and the alt right is where there's way more um people who come from like military backgrounds police backgrounds they you know like i don't think that having a john brown gun club is any match for their um weapons training and experience and and like engagement Alex? <laughs> well, we'll do our best. No. Um, <laughs> I, I definitely think that, I, I guess I, I should differentiate between, you know, retaining and owning guns and practicing with them and using them for self-defense isn't necessarily exactly the same thing. It doesn't mean you have to carry them at a protest. I know that there are some anti-fascist organizers who I respect who actually disagree with that practice, it's like Scott Crow for one, you know, saying that it's alarming that people feel empowered to take their their guns with them to a protest. So that is something that people in the network engage in. I, I think that the Redneck Revolt Network put out a, a podcast recently where they have a, a first person like interview with someone who was on the ground at Charlottesville that I I feel like it makes the point that what they were doing was valid. Obviously the question of whether you want to take guns to a protest is, is something that's very, very specific. You know, it depends drastically on the situation and what your assessment of the risks are and, and the benefits and certainly something like Boston is preferable if you can just get like a thousand times more people to come and shut the park down before they can even get there that's that's great you wouldn't want to have to revert to you know anything more risky than that but I don't think that that's an argument that we shouldn't maintain the capacity to meet force with force if we're required to and I'll just jump in and say that um, I think that's pretty much where I land and I'm going to mostly try to stay out of the um, debate here, but I do want to maybe post to Marianne. Um, from a game theory perspective, if they know that we are not interested in uh, building that capacity or sort of just we'll never will, you know, um, does that disempower us and um, yes or no? Or Again. What I'm trying to figure out, like, what kind of scenario you're envisioning. Are you envisioning a sort of, like, shootout or showdown at the OK Corral? Are you envisioning that, like, both sides protest, get more and more armed, and there's always that potential of violence sort of, like, beneath the surface, but knowing that both are armed, 
it never breaks out. Like I'm trying to figure out exactly what the scenario is. And I'll say, I'll just, I'll speak to like my own chauvinism. So like besides being Canadian, I'm also a mom, a, a, a mom of a little boy. And like, you know, I just looking at, you know, statistics, again, the, the sort of like epidemiology, just from a public health perspective in a household where there's a gun, you know, I, my kid is too young to do this now, but it's not that like my kid, it's not like sufficient to put a gun on a top shelf where a kid can't reach it because like six and seven year olds can move chairs and climb on them and they're really curious and um, kids like to push boundaries. Likewise, if I go to a protest, like my kid comes with me wherever I go and that's partly just because he's still nursing. And so again, like, you know, I have no interest in bringing my kid to uh, a scenario in which there's like, you know, where, where what you want there to be is a plausible chance that like gun violence will become involved or, or you know what I mean? Like, or, or there's a plaus you want the other side to believe that is plausibly, credibly true that you are packing heat. Like that, it, you know, it's just, I think that, to, to again, to double down on my chauvinism, I think that where Americans' sensibilities have landed on this is so far from other sensibilities that you would find elsewhere in the world, including places like Canada or Australia or like Switzerland, which has a lot of guns because there's, uh, you know, mandatory military service or whatever. And I really feel, as an anarchist, that that sensibility is being determined by fundamentally a corporate, private industry gun lobby. And the way that it has shifted, I mean, I was reading an article and they, somebody said that like, if you told somebody from 1940 or 1970 or whatever, where our gun legislation is at now, where our gun culture is at now, now, and where guns are commercially at now, they would not believe you. Like the way that this has been shifted and shifted and shifted over the course of you know, again, pick a, pick a time frame, 30 years, 40 years, 7 years, 100 years, is remarkable. And I see it as something that's being driven by an industry that is, you know, looking to profit off of this product. I don't see it as something that other, other than that would like naturally have just evolved as such among people's cultural practices. Well, I think that firearms have always been kind of near and dear to Americans dating back before the, you know, that type of capitalism, or that type of advertising. But I definitely won't argue with you that, you know, that that, that allowing, you know, that that capitalism as a system is the same the same system that like profits off of like advertising advertising pharmaceuticals and stuff to people is going to have any kind of conscience in terms of the way that it promotes gun ownership if you look at any of the a lot of the you know a lot of the major organizations like the nra is a deeply racist and abhorrent organization right but uh so i won't argue with you in terms of the way that guns are promoted especially by you know manufacturers and the people that sell them but uh i don't think that that necessarily means that they don't have value and i don't i, I don't think that the sentiment that people have about firearms in this country as like a, like a validation of, you know, like Orwell's symbol of democracy, you know, the rifle on the wall is the symbol of democracy. That type of feeling that people have about it only comes from, from advertising. Well, again, I mean, you don't see advertising. I think that it's like the way that the culture has been shifted aggressively by the gun law. Like the idea that American guns have always been near and dear to Americans' hearts, like the idea that there's a continuity there going back to the founding of the country or the 19th century or you know whatever is a myth perpetrated by the NRA in fact gun ownerships gun attitudes towards gun ownership including policy positions adopted by the NRA have just changed dramatically over time like the NRA used to be one of the biggest advocates for like gun control and firearms and safety and they were a hunting club until basically a sort of like inside takeover happened in the 1970s but they were one of the biggest advocates for gun control and this idea that um like one cannot that that like it is fundamental to one's exercise of one's individual liberty to own a gun is of much much more recent vintage i don't think the idea of guns being near and dear to americans hearts going back hundreds of years is any truer 
than other places that have legacies of like frontiership and colonialism like Canada, Australia, etc. It's, it's my understanding. I'm not really an expert on that subject, admittedly, though. I'm, I'm trying, <laughs> trying my best, but if you look at other documents that talk about, you know, from the period, like Vermont's constitution, actually, when it talks about gun ownership, it specifically mentions as do a few other people commenting on the Second Amendment at the time, that it's that people should retain, you know, that they say the common people should retain their firearms because a standing army is, is counter to, you know, counter to liberty or a threat to democracy or something like that, so. By the same token, like earlier uh, verdicts or judgments by judges regarding, like, the Second Amendment made reference to the fact that, like, the state itself has an interest in regulating things like um, things like uh, gun ownership and and you know whether or not you can have a concealed weapon and whether or not and, and just kind of articulated the idea that states so individual states um, this was a concern of theirs and and that like this is something that should be regulated you know everything is regulated like, your ability to drive a car is regulated again for reasons of public health and public safety and for some reason that's been kind of like taken off the table it is illegal for the for federal monies in the cdc to be used to for studying um the effects of guns on the population like you know it's this is infused with ideology well let me uh, turn the table for a moment then so uh marianne if we're not gonna fight fire with fire, um, let's say with the alt-right in the short term and uh, ultimately in some kind of military conflict in the uh, pending uh, anarchist revolution that we all uh, want, what does um, self-defense and uh, winning revolutionary uh, situations look like um, if we've sort of moved away from guns or something like that, like, what does that look like? Well, again, like self-defense to me does not mean some kind of like, you know, Wild West, John Wayne situation where you each draw your like six shooter from your hip. Like the, to me, the self-defense of um, people like, you know, the working class or, or um, trans people or people of color, women, looks like the political mobilization, which, you know, we could have a whole other podcast about that. I have ideas about what it looks like in the case of labor, which is like solidarity unionism, um, in which um, direct action is, and, and, and immediate like refusal and shop floor action is mobilized in order to take power away from the boss and put it in the hands of the working class, for example. Um, you know, I could riff on what I think it means for like, on any other group too. For women, I think it means like, again, significant political and social mobilization um, in order to combat patriarchy and all of its attitudes in all of its contexts, as well as like, again, materially ensuring the safety of women. I think that one of the biggest forefronts right now is like, you know, uh, reproductive health in the United States. Um, in the case of people of color or people um, or immigrants in this country, of which I am one, I think it looks like massive social and political mobilization against the ways that immigrants are targeted, not just like snatched for deportation, which is happening, but also um, like l laws that, you know, make it, make police, empower police to look into people's um, immigration status that women are afraid to call the police on their domestic abusers. Or there is a campaign in New York that I've been somewhat involved in where um, the employer demanded all of his employees at a bakery produce proof of their eligibility to work in the country and then fired them all um, when they didn't do so, like within a very short turnaround of time. And so, you know, that's what it looks like. Frankly, I think that the vast majority of the repression that we're facing looks like that and doesn't look like, um, you know, the sort of like 80 morons with tiki torches shouting nonsensical phrases. I also think that the latter is opposed like the hegemonic position in society is completely in opposition to the alt-right like we had Mitt Romney tweeting about it for god's sakes like nobody likes these people other than like themselves and they're extremely extremely small for the time being and 
to continue to bring those mass mass mobilizations against them, the likes of which we saw in Boston, I take it that we're going to need a left that is not like, you know, um, itself appearing marginal, and, and instead it's going to have to be a kind of like massification against that. Um, so, like, it, it's, it's, this is the difficult question of like, where does any social change come from? Um, but again, like, to me, the defense of like name a marginalized group doesn't primarily or even secondarily or tertiarily look like um, overt confrontations with like extremely marginal groups in the streets. Yeah, uh, I'm really I'm struggling with being a, a debater here because really I largely agree with a lot of what you have to say, especially in terms of you know mass mobilizations and you know workplace organization and whatnot. I I definitely support all of that, and I think that it's quite critical. You know, I mean, firearms are not particularly meaningful outside of the context of like a struggle <laughs> like that. I also want us to not completely forgo the idea that. Uh, tor Tiki torch wielding Nazis, you know, those guys like beat people with like two by fours and shit, you know, I mean, when you're on the receiving end of that kind of violence, you know, even if it's from a fringe group, like, that's that has real consequences for people, and I want people that feel threatened by that violence to have to choose to respond to it how they want, and up to and including, you know, arming themselves or arming their communities, so, uh, I just feel strongly about that. Um, I think that it. I think that it's worth pursuing. We're just pausing to see where we're at. Um, sure. You guys. <laughs> everybody's everybody's way too reasonable here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I should have brought my crazy friend on. It would have been a lot more fun. Yeah, but I think it's important to show that this like doesn't have to be a extremely emotional um, debate because that's where it goes a lot. And I think that. This is, there's a lot of utility in showing that even opposing sides have a lot more in common than you might think, and it doesn't have to resort to a hyperbolic name calling, you know, names. So here's here's my maybe last thing that we can keep it moderately short, hopefully at least. Um, I think this was touched on earlier. So the conditions of, let's say, the 60s um, were such that it was really understandable for uh, uh, black self-defense groups to pop up and um, push that line. Um, are conditions different now? Um, if so, why? Why is why is that strategy maybe not uh, just as important, if not more? Well, if we're talking about civil rights and self-defense, like the Deacons and you know people that defended Martin Luther King and stuff, I'm really inspired by someone who I recently learned about who. His name is Robert F. Williams, and he was an NAACP uh, leader in Monroe in one of the Carolinas. My southern geography is not very good, unfortunately. But uh, he was a vet, and he came back after the war to lynch mobs, you know, and uh, Jim Crow, and he organized his community to defend uh, itself against the Klansmen. But he he has a, there's a, he wrote about his experiences in an autobiography. It's called Negroes with Guns, and he. He makes the point that even though they they had these they like you know they had an armed self defense unit that they would set up outside people's houses so when the Klansmen rode by they would you know scare them off with their sandbags and rifles and stuff but he makes the point that they also were able to engage in nonviolent demonstrations they also did a campaign to integrate the public swimming pool to integrate the public library and did counter sit-ins and. He said, you know, everybody actually respected us a lot more. They weren't even, they didn't even spit on us when we did our nonviolence because they saw our capacity for self-defense. And I, I just wanted to, I was looking for an opportunity to mention that story tonight at least. So, but well, I think that that's, I like the, the his, uh, position, that they're not mutually exclusive. That just because you retain the capacity in an extreme situation to meet force with force doesn't mean that it shapes your entire existence or, you know, your judgment of what, how to participate in other movements. That's how the Panthers were, too. I mean, they didn't necessarily harm school children when they were giving out lunches to them, you know. Maybe they did, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, here's your apple and your sandwich and a small revolver. 
<laughs> Something that I think is different too, even though you didn't really ask me, is but one thing that I think is really important, a difference, if you were to ask what's different between non civil rights movement is um, the militarization of the police is, is really different than it was um, in the 60s. Uh, and it's, it's like growing exponentially. So if we're talking about cops rolling in with tanks, that wasn't really happening. <laughs> Save for like specific riots and uprisings, um, the, the fact that like in um, really small towns now, you have SWAT teams um, that can just like kind of come out of nowhere um, to, to attack people with guns. I think it's really different. It would look different if you're talking about arming minority communities. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask Marianne to jump in, but I do want to say that the deacons uh, particularly are just sort of a um, sort of hidden gem of civil rights history and seems like a really important American case to look at. So in, in my mind, I'm really interested in seeing how we think America may be different now than, than then, because it sure seemed to work um, on some level back then. So I wasted my turn with a joke, but that a minute ago, that was my opportunity to say, I completely agree with everything Alex said. Um, and I think that this sort of the take home is the fact that like you know guns i wouldn't i don't think anybody is disputing that guns can be very useful tools of like physical self-defense right so guns are tools and as tools they're very good at like you know making people afraid and putting holes in people and you, there are other instances that we could cite like in the labor movement for example a friend of mine who's younger than i am uh was a coal miner in would it be West Virginia? I forget which of the Virginians has the coal. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. And uh, at one point, their union um, used their dues funds to purchase firearms for everybody in the local um, to prevent, you know, the sort of like whatever modern day Pinkertons, you know, the cops from like, um, like coming and repressing people. So I hope I'm not being understood to say they don't think that guns have any utility. They clearly have utility as do most tools. Um, what I don't think they do is amass political power. And I think that that's a crucial difference and I think that there's a lot, there's there's very often this leap being made <clears throat> especially among leftists that like, you know, hey, wait a minute I see a group of people who are disempowered those people don't have any guns let's give those people some guns and then they will be less disempowered or something like that or able to accumulate political power or something like that yeah there's a scenario in which like one person shoots another person to protect their like for example uh, i i don't think that there's anything mysterious about the fact that like black people in the 30s 40s 50s 60s wanted to own firearms to forestall clansmen lynchings of them and their family like there is nothing you know um not understandable about that but the question is like, and, and that's why I like that Alex followed up with that other story, is like, how much does that do towards political organizing? Like they had to also organize politically on top of that. The, the, the situation in which you like literally have to, at a last resort, defend your actual life with a firearm in like a sort of like person to person exchange is the worst case scenario. It's not a model for shifting power dynamics in society in general out there and mix it up with people and hear from people in the actual communities you know that we're talking about and you know respond to these criticisms and have these types of dialectics so it's definitely super valuable i really appreciate the chance to be able to do it i'm sorry i just want to say that i think none of you are real revolutionaries and that you'll all be sent to the gulag for disagreeing <laughs> with me as soon as possible that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of anarchists too. So yeah, everyone's an anarchist now. Me. Sure, everyone's an anarchist. Yeah, woo. Well, thank you both so much. I'm seriously really thrilled. Like that was so good. Um, and thank you so much for just jumping into it and playing ball with us and being yeah. so smart and thoughtful and respectful of everything. And um, I'm actually challenged, and I'm going to be whirling about it all mm. night. So yeah, yeah, me too. This has been a great discussion. Thanks to everybody.